Last year in Paris at uh, COP21, of course, uh, the end of the COP was marked by the Paris Agreement, uh, which in some sense is a uh, guide to policy by uh, setting uh, national objectives. However, the beginning of COP uh, the very first day is when 20 leaders, including President Obama, announced Mission Innovation. Mission Innovation uh, is a commitment by these 20 countries that collectively invest about $15 billion a year uh, in uh, energy technology R&D to double that to $30 billion uh, over a five-year period. So this was very important in the sense that it acknowledged uh, the critical role of innovation uh, in meeting our climate goals. So the mission innovation uh, countries span the world. In North America, we have, not surprisingly, uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, and we work together now much more closely uh, in terms of regional uh, activities uh, in clean energy. We have South America with uh, Brazil, Chile, the Far East, of course, very, very importantly, China uh, as a, a major economy and the world's largest emitter, but also South Korea and Japan and Indonesia, uh, a country less advanced in the, in the development curve, but very interested in, uh, in innovation. We have countries in the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, we have uh, the UAE, the Emirates. We have the EU, but also nine European countries individually. And that includes, of course, the large economies like uh, Germany and you know, UK and France and Italy. So it's a, it's a very, very broad uh, collection of countries and again, very importantly, uh, these countries uh, represent probably something like 75 or 80 percent uh, of the world's investment uh, in clean energy technology. Actually, probably even a bit more than that. So as I said earlier, a doubling from around 15 billion uh, to 30 billion uh, is what we expect. Now, the countries uh, have gotten together uh, in the intervening year uh, in a number of ways, uh, including a workshop uh, that identified seven initial areas uh, for, for focus. Uh, they're called innovation challenge uh, areas. Uh, and they, again, span uh, some of the obvious, uh, perhaps, uh, areas like uh, advanced biofuels and uh, energy storage. Uh, but they also go to areas like uh, carbon capture and to the conversion of sunlight into fuels. At the same time that Mission Innovation was announced, Bill Gates, representing 28 international investors, announced the Breakthrough Energy Coalition uh, to put forward patient capital to take advantage of this expanded innovation pipeline that will come from the doubled uh, R&D. So fundamentally, uh, in Paris, a linkage was made. Innovation, investment, policy, all working synergistically uh, to, to meet our goals. I will add to that that uh, the innovation uh, is really critical. Uh, sometimes there's what I would call a false choice uh, put forward. Namely, some will argue, well, we have all the technologies we need. Let's just get them deployed. Others say, no, we need uh, new technologies, big breakthroughs. The answer, obviously, is we need both. That is, in the relatively short term, uh, we need to deploy the technologies uh, that, we, that we have, that we see uh, with major cost reduction. But for the long term, we are going to need to get much, much more ambitious to go to deep decarbonization. Uh, and I certainly believe, uh, as do others, uh, that we will need uh, some big breakthroughs uh, to, to meet those kinds of deep decarbonization goals. We have to span all the sectors. Uh, and that includes industry, where, after all, if we're going to have this climate uh, transformation, it has to occur uh, together uh, with continuing manufacturing industries and the like. Well, those are going to have to also be low carbon. So it's a very, very broad agenda. Uh, and uh, we will not get there, in my view, without uh, success uh, in innovation. And I will also emphasize innovation that links governments, investors, entrepreneurs, obviously technologists, uh, all working together. The innovation change that we need is one that is ideal for students to get engaged with. And I know from my career at, uh, at MIT, uh, students were tremendously excited uh, about uh, uh, joining 
uh, this, uh, this, this, this transformational effort. Now, when I say students, obviously uh, scientists and engineers are central to the uh, technology innovation that we require. However, I want to emphasize that the innovation uh, needs are much broader than technology innovation, and that's why we had students from across the entire institute engaged. So, for example, business model innovation is going to be critical uh, in a low-carbon world. So certainly our business school students, our Sloan School students at MIT, uh, were in fact uh, leaders uh, in pursuing these sustainable uh, goals. Policy innovation is going to be needed. Uh, so we had our political scientists, economists, uh, very, very deeply involved. And of course, uh, it's also issues like urban design. We see, of course, urbanization uh, is one of the major demographic trends around the world. Uh, we're heading uh, towards 70% urbanization uh, in this half century uh, globally. So the roles of cities, how they are designed, how transportation systems are integrated with uh, advanced urban design is critical. So our, our architects, our urban planners, they were all engaged. Uh, buildings are places where uh, we absolutely need to get much greater efficiency, uh, the building itself and what's inside the building. One more point I would make is that the impact of this innovation will be very synergistic with policy. For example, if we think in terms of a carbon price, the carbon price innovation individually will have major impacts, but when you put them together, they can have a much bigger impact. My physicist uh, background says nonlinear. Uh, uh, and that's because, for example, even a modest carbon policy, if we have the fruits of innovation in terms of uh, lowering costs uh, and expanding opportunity, what you'll see is that policy will drive deployment of those technologies much faster. So that's the kind of synergy that we will need to meet our deep decarbonization goals. There's a real question about how to uh, get these policies in place, uh, how to stimulate uh, market demand. Well, there's a lot that we can do, but uh, I will note that in the energy business, capital allocations can be massive, require a long time. They're decadal in their formation, and those investments have to pay off over many decades. Many of the capital assets in the energy business have a very, very long lifetime. The point of that is that business, in my view, is looking for clear signals. Uh, because if they're going to have big infrastructure investments, uh, for example, or big power plant investments, uh, those investments for, say, 2030, have to start being formulated in 2020, uh, to pick numbers somewhat arbitrarily. But uh, the idea is they are, they are decadal. And so, business would like to know what, what are the rules of the game? Uh, how are the rules of the game going to support their capital allocations uh, for long-lived assets uh, in a deep decarbonization world? I think the, uh, go the, the climate change goals, the, uh, the, national, uh, kind of the national goals that have been set in Paris, for example, uh, I think uh, uh, will be met because for one thing, Mother Nature will keep talking to us uh, about the need to respond. And what we are seeing already is large amounts of resource is needed already to respond to what we are seeing from global warming. Let's just take the recent example in the United States of Hurricane Matthew. Well, in fact, Hurricane Matthew did lead to a loss of power to about 3 million customers in the Southeast. But the recovery from that was actually much faster than it had been uh, earlier, say, for Sandy along the East Coast. And why was that? It was because a utility, I use Florida Power and Light as, as an example. I visited them earlier in 2016. Well, they had invested as one utility $2 billion uh, in terms of improved resilience to the kinds of storms and flooding that Florida is more and more prone to uh, in this world of global warming. And those two billion are the first of another two billion uh, that they will be spending in the next couple of years. Well, when one utility is having to spend 
billions and billions of dollars adapting, they have an interest in seeing mitigation uh, be, uh, be successful. So uh, the reality is, I think the public is more and more aware uh, that, uh, first of all, the climate is changing, uh, that we have to respond to that. And I think eventually the clearly correct uh, notion uh, that investing in mitigation now is overall the economically preferable way to go. I will note that there's another very important factor in my view uh, where we do need to spend more, uh, spend more attention uh, and devote uh, more, more effort. And that is that in any societal transformation, and we see that in many ways with technology, with globalization, and now in going to a low carbon energy system, there are dislocations. Uh, overall, the economy can do very well. Uh, overall, uh, we in the United States with our, frankly, innovation edge uh, can, can access a multi-trillion dollar market globally for these new technologies. But there will be communities and regions that are more on the flip side of that equation. So I think that we also need a clear job strategy we need a strategy that looks at uh, the distribution of benefits across our society uh, so that we get tailwinds and not headwinds uh, as we pursue our innovation agenda and our energy system transformation. The innovation needs uh, are certainly uh, global uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, one way, first of all, is we need to bring all the talent uh, we can bring to bear uh, on this innovation challenge. Uh, and that talent is certainly distributed uh, around the world. I think in the United States, we have the advantage of a mature innovation system uh, that, uh, that our entrepreneurs and investors and technologists can, uh, can fit into. But another point is that the needs, uh, the portfolio uh, for a low carbon future will also look very different regionally. Uh, and, uh, and in different countries around the world. Uh, and clearly, uh, very often, uh, one can best innovate uh, in a local context in which the needs are understood and the needs drive, uh, drive the innovation as opposed to the other, the, the other way around. Uh, so uh, you can imagine that the way this innovation is, uh, uh, materializes, let's say, in, a, in an industrialized society, uh, with a well-developed infrastructure, uh, sometimes with the burden of a well-developed and old infrastructure, will look very different from a country that is just in the earlier stages of development uh, and has both the challenge of not having adequate energy services today, but also the opportunity uh, to develop a 21st century infrastructure uh, that is not burdened uh, by, uh, by history. So there are pluses and minuses, and innovation uh, will have to serve all of these needs globally.